Hi, Joyce. Hey, are you there? Hi. Hello. I'm here. I don't see you. Do you see me? Uh, let me adjust to speaker view. Maybe that'll help. Yeah, something happened. Oh, you can see me now? Okay, great. <laughs> it's so um, much a part of our lives now. I guess it's yeah. so, not so different from a telephone, really, telephone conversation. Yeah, it's about the same. It's just you have to check your hair before you <laughs> go on the call, I guess. So how have you been um, the past few months? Have you been able to get out more and, and see people some more? Well, I, I've i always been seeing people. You know, I live sort of out in the country, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm near country roads, and I go walking and running with my friends. My, my life hasn't changed really that much. It's more that I've lost Charlie, mm. and I don't, you know, my husband's has passed away, so... Yeah. That's a profound change in my life. I don't. I think the pandemic doesn't affect me as much as it affects other people. Mm -hmm. I haven't lost my job. I continue to teach two courses, one at NYU and one at Princeton, mm -hmm. and I continue to, to do my writing. You know. Yeah, and it's not but, too difficult doing the the courses remotely or just over Zoom calls. Oh, no, I think that what's uh. You know, the most profound difference is that one can't really travel. I can't really go to New York. I can't teach my students in a classroom. But unlike some people in the pandemic, especially people who don't have much uh, resources, I haven't lost my job. So I, I feel somewhat privileged. Yeah, I, I sort of feel in the, the same position that not a huge amount has changed for me since I'm very easily able to work from home. So um, I can do pretty much everything I need to here. And I'm um, lucky enough to have a, you know, spacious enough apartment. So it's not too cramped or uncomfortable spending a lot amount of time here. So um, yeah, I, I feel very lucky. Yeah. All I see is books behind you. Yeah, I have um, shelves and shelves going up to the ceiling. So. <laughs> <laughs> Our books are scattered all around the house in different rooms. Mm -hmm. This is Charlie and I put our libraries together and, and Charlie, he had us a particular interest in the history of science mm -hmm. and the history of uh, neuroscience. So he's got all of Darwin's work and other work of 19th century science. And so mm -hmm. in his study, I'm not, I'm not in his study, I'm in a different room, but mm -hmm. the walls of books and they're very, very uh, different from the books in, in, in my part of the house. <laughs> There's uh, Zanche, right? Nancy, yes. <laughs> heard your voice. She's getting a little shameless. She likes her. She's got some ad admirers. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's, uh, she's uh, very beautiful. Yeah. She is very beautiful and she's extremely heavy. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. You can get your daily exercise by lifting her up and down. <laughs> there's, there's a smaller cat down here. So I've uh, been really enjoying following your um, your film club, as you've been calling it on Twitter, uh, oh, where yeah. you've been watching a lot of old movies um, uh, with uh, Judy Holliday, who's one of my favorite actresses. And uh, there's that excellent adaptation of uh, Henry James' novel, The Heiress, with Olivia de Havilland. Um, which uh, I only just watched for the first time recently too. Is this a, a new hobby you've acquired during this time at home or have you always been an avid film viewer? No, this is like during the pandemic. Because I have a friend who's interested in movies also. Mm -hmm. I, I just didn't know any of those old classics. I mm -hmm. had not seen any Judy Halliday movie. I had seen these movies of the 1930s, the famous movies like It Happened One Night, You Can't Take It With You. Mm -hmm. and others i just never saw them and the heirs which is more recent the innocence with deborah carr mm -hmm. all those wonderful black and white classics i had never seen mm -hmm. so that's one thing i'm doing during the pandemic that's a little different and recently there was a lot of uh press coverage and talk about a photo of your foot that you posted on twitter um and obviously i was concerned about your yeah, health was... as well and wanted to check that you're okay now, but um, so but I was a, <laughs> you didn't intend for that to really yeah. go so wide. Well, I sent this tweet to my to one of my Twitter friends, Luck, who was hiking. Mm. He's a hiker. Mm. And I said, you know, I went out and I have this on my foot. Do you think it's poison ivy or poison oak? What do you think it is? It was mostly just wanting to know what it was. Yeah. You know, it never occurred to me. It just never occurred to me that, that you know, that it would matter. That mm. most of my tweets don't get much attention. Mm. And, you know, for some reason, it got more attention. I don't know. I don't know why. 
Yeah, it's strange how some of these things just sort of take on a life of their own and <laughs> become so, which yeah. um, it always seems so peculiar to me because I think like, why wouldn't people be talking about your novels more? <laughs> that That's the more interesting thing then. <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot online about rashes and there are a lot of virulent rashes mm -hmm. and there's something new. It's called uh, giant hog's weed. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a predator invasive species. Mm -hmm. So that's what evidently I had. Hmm. That's what some people were telling me. Even hmm. Margaret Atwood responded. She says it's giant hogweed. Oh uh, yeah, she would know. <laughs> and she knew the symptoms. Of it. It's kind of nice in a way to get a communal response that was helpful. In some hmm. cases, it was helpful. I mean, I went to a doctor and he just gave me a prescription for an infection. Mm -hmm. He didn't try to diagnose what it was from. Hmm. <laughs> but yeah, one but... has to be very careful. Yeah, hikers should beware, I guess. <laughs> and also careful of Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> that as well, of course. Um, but uh, but I am, of course, very eager to discuss your new book, Cardiff by the Sea, um, which is subtitled Four Novellas of Suspense. And it is a gripping collection of fiction, which also has several connecting themes. Um, and of course, these were all first published separately, um, but I'm curious, how you went about selecting these specific novellas to appear in a book together? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I was working on Cardiff by the Sea for quite a while when I was in Berkeley. Mm. And I probably had thought of similar themes that would fit together. I, I, had, a, I had a collection of short novels or novellas called Evil Eye. Mm -hmm. a few years ago and I like I like the form of the long short story or the novella that's a form that I feel very comfortable with you can build up characters and you can have a story and a plot but it's not too complicated and not too many characters and it won't be too long and it's I think Henry James called the novella the blessed form mm -hmm. and it is very a very wonderful form the turn of the screw is a short novel I don't know that I don't know that it's a novella it's probably a little long for a novella, mm. but there's just a sort of exquisite uh, length of 35, 40, 50 pages that is, is very satisfying to read, but actually hard to write. Mm. Oh, I, I, yeah, I imagine it must be. And Cardiff by the Sea is longer than that. I mm. wasn't really able to, to end it that, that soon. I compare it to have, being in an air, a small airplane and you're circling around and the, the runway is below and it's a certain um, a finite runway. It's not very long, and you have to you have to land your plane on the short runway, and so you go over and you realize you can't do it, and you come back another time and you keep trying mm -hmm. to to rein it in, you know, to make the the novella not too long, mm -hmm. and it's with me. It's always sort of a struggle between make, making something short enough so that it's dramatic and yet long enough so that it's not sketchy. It, it feels to me like you often test the possibilities of what fiction can do in these short stories and novellas. Um, so do you see this constrained space as um, a place where you can be more playful and experimental in a way than you can in a longer novel? Well, that might be. When I started with Cardiff by the Sea, I have a sort of philosophical ideas that I want to write about, but the philosophical ideas really get um, effaced. I, I, I sort of I begin with those ideas, but then I don't really pursue them. I wanted to follow through on the idea of the contingency of life. The phone rings. There's a phone ringing. You know, it's a real phone. It's not a cell phone. A landline, yeah. Yeah. And does she answer the phone? You know, well, there's a whole universe, the alternative universe, where you don't answer the phone. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole mystery ends in one paragraph <laughs> and you can just continue with your 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 life but then she she sort of thinks well maybe i'll answer the phone so she answers the phone and it precipitates a whole a whole drama you know because of that consequence of a, an action in one moment in time your whole life is is altered mm. i'm drawn to that quite a bit i'm writing a lot a longer work now, I hope it won't be too long, maybe three, I'm trying to keep this under 300 pages. Mm -hmm. 
and that's uh, explaining these alternative realities where a person does this because I'm thinking of my own self and and surely in your life too. Mm -hmm. There are these alternatives that at the time were equally attractive or they were equally indifferent, you know, mm -hmm. but there may have been three of them, uh, like a, a path that splits into three forks. And you took one of them, you know, like Robert Frost, and he said, they all looked at, they both looked alike, said Robert Frost in the poem. He doesn't say one is more attractive. He said one is less traveled by, but he said, but really they're both about the same. That's what the poem says, but it's made all the difference in his life because his life went in one direction. So in a novel that I'm working on, we sort of see her moving in different directions and we come back and we see what the uh, kind of reckless act that she does and what it precipitates, you know? And I'm not sure that I can make that work. I do keep experimenting. Mm. And I think that something is too obviously ex experimental, then it looks contrived and more cerebral. Mm -hmm. And I don't really want to do that. So sometimes I take out these things and I move a few steps back and I, I go in a different direction. There's just a, a revenant in Cardiff by the Sea of that original theme, I think at the very end. So in my novel, Night, Sleep, Death and the Stars, that's a purely realistic novel. It doesn't have any uh, experimental qualities to a uh, tone. These are things that writers are interested in that nobody else is interested in, maybe. Well, I think a lot of readers are as well, because, you know, we can, if, um, you know, if you're, if you're reading sensitively, then you can see that the, that does reflect how life is. And, and I think it's why I connect to your fiction so strongly because you often write about these moments where a seemingly trivial decision can change, you know, your life completely. And you knew if you didn't do that thing or, or take that path that, uh, that, yeah, things would have been completely different in your life. I think maybe it speaks more to somebody who, you know, has a, that kind of reflective sensibility who likes to sort of sit and mull over these things and, and yeah. uh, think so how different your life could be. So what remains of that is the last chapter. It's a, it's a whole chapter. Because the, the novella ends, he is the one, he will, with her reconciliation with her, her, her uncle, a person she's really just come, discovered in her life. And at first we think that he's a hideous person and he is sort of physically hideous, but then she comes to some sort of uh, reconciliation. But then there's a final chapter and the phone is ringing. So she feels this jolt of joy, like a shot of heroin to the heart, either transports you to paradise or slams you to the floor dead. So you pick up the phone and not that I'm a heroin addict or have any experience with it, but heroin is, a, is like a metaphor for something that can be just a very idyllic and very, I guess, very potent. Mm -hmm. People say you're never supposed to try heroin because then you always remember it and there's nothing so wonderful and you'll remember it all your life. You know, it's not a good idea to experiment with that. So she doesn't know, is it going to kill her or is it going to take her to paradise? So we're sort of back in the beginning with, with the phone ringing. Mm. I have to say that through my whole life, especially in recent years, I seem to be confronted so much with these alternatives. You probably have had some totally life-changing events in your life mm. that might have gone the other way and you would have lost a lot. Yeah, I think especially as, you know, an American who lives in the UK and when and I only first came to England sort of um, on, a, on a whim and thought I would only stay a short amount of time and um, now I've been here over 20 years and so obviously that's I would have had that's a completely amazing. different life in America. But that's amazing. That's like, a, that's like a wonderful story in itself. Mm. And I think that too, because I was it in the 1970s or, or at some point when you spent around four or five months in England, I think. Yeah, um, I think it was about a year. Yeah. Was, oh, yeah. Could, so quite a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So that was much more planned. I mean, mm. there's some things that we do very deliberately. My husband, Ray Smith, was was writing a book and he was an English professor, a professor of English literature. Well, his specialty was the 18th century and, and we came to, he would do some research in the British Museum, which he did. So that was very planned, you know. Mm -hmm. But there are other things, like you said, you came to, to England probably just, you know, to travel and explore a new world. And then something happened. A lot of people have their experience with California. Mm. They 
something out there and then they just stay forever. Yeah, it has that kind of draw to it. <laughs> so um, getting back to the, um, the novellas, we, we've talked in the past about your keen interest in genre and you do often seem quite drawn to writing stories of suspense. And you've published several suspense novels under a pseudonym. Uh, so what is it about the constraints of this genre that inspires and delights you as a writer? Well, I'm very interested in genre just because I'm a formalist. I'm essentially an experimental writer. Uh, I think I'm mostly known as a social realist. The novels that I write, my realistic novels are authentic. I, I have uh, real places. Sometimes I change the names, but they're real places. And the history is real in the popular culture. But then I'm also drawn to a, a different genre, which is not realistic, it's more surreal. I consider that playful and experimental. It's sort of like the unconscious speaking mm -hmm. and social realism is more looking at the conscious world. And then within the genres, there's such interesting variants. Like there's one genre that I'm not, I'm really not drawn to. And I, I would almost like to experiment with trying to write it. It's the locked room mystery, you know, so-called golden age of mystery. Mm -hmm. I suppose Agatha, Agatha Christie is in that tradition. John yeah. Dixon Carr. Um, I'm just sort of interested what you could do with that. It's like writing in a form, the sonnet form is very malleable. You can write sonnets that are very experimental where the rhymes are different. Some people write free verse sonnets. They're the same length as a, as a Shakespearean sonnet, but they don't rhyme and they don't have the, the quatrains and so forth. So there's something about the, the restriction or the form that allows you a curious sort of freedom, you know, to experiment. Yeah. So writing a story like The Surviving Child in, in this collection, I wanted to write about something that had interested me for many, many years. And I'm sure it interests you, especially since you're living in London. The Death of Sylvia Plath by her own hand, with, uh, she, she gassed herself. We know that Ted Hughes second, um, he, he was having a love affair with a woman whose last name, I don't remember her first name, I think the last name was Weevil, W-E-E-V-I-L. And I may have misspelled that because I haven't seen it for a while. So Ted Hughes was having a love affair with this other woman who is very beautiful and, and exotic. I think she may have been European. And Sylvia Plath was devastated. And it was really a case that Sylvia Plath was so depressed and so angry. I mean, that her act of suicide was an act of anger and aggression as well as annihilating herself. She was really angry. So the woman with whom Ted Hughes was living, they were living together when Sylvia Plath committed suicide. That woman then became his, his mistress and he was living with her. She had a baby with him. She was so haunted by Sylvia Plath. She was so haunted by what had happened to her, to her predecessor mm. that as you know, she committed suicide the same way, except she took a baby with her. She mm. took a baby with her. So I, wanted, I always wanted to write about that overwhelming phenomenon of, of hauntedness, mm. being haunted. Mm. You know, we, most of us are not so interested in ghosts because the ghosts are not real, of course. Ghosts are just, you know, silly. I mean, haunted castles are a literary convention. They don't, they don't exist in reality. Mm -hmm. But yet psychologically and emotionally, we're, we're all haunted. We're haunted by our early parents, by our childhood, by things that happened to us when we were children. Mm -hmm. Some of us are haunted obsessively. Some of us have learned to deal with it. But in this case, this woman was so haunted by what had happened to her predecessor. And I think Ted Hughes also was. Mm, and I think Ted Hughes was breaking up with her. He was pushing her away. Mm. And I don't think he was seeing her anymore. There was, Ted Hughes emerges as a kind of horrific villain in this, and feminists absolutely hate him. But I see him as being locked into some of the same unconscious and compulsive behavior that looking back on it, he probably wouldn't have done the things that he did, but he was sort of trapped. So she committed suicide mm -hmm. and took a baby with her. So my, my novella, The Surviving Child, 
uh, touches upon that, you know, you're moving, moving into the household of someone who had committed suicide in that very house, had killed one child, but the other child had escaped. And now that child is your stepson, you know, mm -hmm. and that I had to, which was pleasurable, create a poetic persona for this woman who had committed suicide, who's not, who's not Sylvia Plath, but she's somebody like that. So mm -hmm. I created a kind of poetry for her, her, which was fun for me to do. It's really interesting that um, that was your inspiration for it, because uh, I was thinking more of Rebecca, um, because it, it um, it sort of feels like a similar sort of atmosphere and situation of a, a new wife coming into a situation. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of Rebecca. I haven't probably read that novel since I was 12 years old, but definitely thinking of Sylvia Plath, thinking of somebody who is doing her PhD dissertation on another kind of poet, um, um, HD, a different, a very different kind of poet, not a confessional poet. Mm -hmm. And thinking of the novella as a way of exploring different voices in poetry women's poetry. H.D. aspired to this impersonal, imagistic poetry, which is very beautiful and stark, maybe like Zen poetry. Mm -hmm. Sylvia Plath plunged into her own self, and it's very confessional, mm -hmm. and sort of playing with the different kinds of poetry and voices for women. Mm -hmm. So my character, the protagonist of that novella, who's haunted by the woman who commits suicide, so she begins as one sort of person, she's interested in one sort of poetry, but then she's seduced or overwhelmed by the other, by the other kind of, mm. kind of poetry. And I suppose I feel that way in my own life. Mm. To write about something totally objective and not yourself is a challenge and can be very rewarding. Mm. But then the call of the gravitational call of your own life and confessional things, that's very, seductive mm. so through my life as a writer i've done i've tried both both things i guess they have different challenges to trying to write and yeah either a very personal, yeah. about personal things or yeah about yes. more objective and then, and then seeing it as a ghost story where somebody might read it as a ghost story mm. a dead woman is sort of sometimes she seems to be in the leaves and the trees well, we would probably think, or I would think, it's a hallucination on the part of the exhausted and um, emotionally sort of enervated stepmother. She's having some difficulty in, in the marriage. So, But somebody might read it as an actual ghost story. And I think that's how we read ghost stories today. They're a phenomenon of haunted, being haunted by something. Yeah. And I mean, the, the way you write that story and create a sense of atmosphere um, really adds to that. Um, there's a, just like as way of an example, there's a fantastic line in The Surviving Child where you write, uh, doorknobs feel uncomfortably warm when touched like inner organs. And yeah. this evokes such an unsettling sensation and does so much to form that, that sense of atmosphere in the house, which may or may not be haunted. Um, so. Um, could you you speak more about the process of creating that that atmosphere in the language of a story like this? Well, I probably just use my imagination, and some of it may have been from real life. There's there's one scene where she's just eating, and she's a whole lot of spinach. She sort of choking, mm. and I think it was after because I've had some emotional ups and downs myself, mm. which I hope you don't have to have in in your life. So it's, it's hard not to. But after, after my first husband died and after Charlie died too, because I've been widowed twice, you know, you sort of enter this, this period of time, which maybe I'm still in, where you're almost physically ill and you have things don't seem to go quite right. And I remember doing a lot of coughing. I remember I was coughing a lot. Mm. And I seemed like, like some physical failure or something like I was being strangled, mm -hmm. that I couldn't get back to my old health. I'm sure we all have a certain sense of our, ourselves that we feel like ourselves, you know. And so mm -hmm. sometimes you hear people say, well, I don't feel like myself. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know what that means exactly, but for a person who's had a, a loss, 
it seems to mean that you you've actually lost some of your own self you know so you're not running as well you're not walking as well you're not um, you cough more you have more accidents i remember after ray died it just seemed that i would i would get in more accidental situations mm. and maybe there's something like um be, becoming accident prone that you become careless with your own life you're you feel you don't care if you live or die or something but i remember coming back home a lot and seeing that the door was open or unlocked and and i've never done that before it's kind of strange it's like some other person and when i wrote the, the novel blonde which of course is the story of norma jean baker becomes marilyn monroe uh, we know that when norma jean was a girl she had the sort of fantasy of the magic self and that magic self was herself in the mirror when she was naked mm -hmm. she would see her magic self and that self when she was naked had this strange power now she would she didn't walk around naked in the world but she felt extremely insecure she was very very haunted by the fact that her mother never could embrace her, her mother was schizophrenic but when Marilyn Monroe is a girl of 16, 17, 18, when she was working in a, a defense uh, factory, I think in Van Nuys, California, this is during World War II, uh, she would wear her dungarees and she would walk to work, you know? Mm -hmm. And all these men in the cars would whistle at her and wave to her and honk the, honk the horn. And she'd sort of look around with this smile, you know, like, hey, they like me, somebody, somebody likes me, mm. and kind of smiling with a, a sort of in, ingenuous look. So that was her magic self. Her magic self wasn't her, it wasn't her, mm. it was her body. And the, the effect she had on people in the world that she didn't uh, expect at the, in the beginning. Later on, of course, she, she knew how to exploit that. Mm. But I always thought that was very interesting. And when I wrote the novel, there was a sort of split between Norma Jean and the, the Marilyn Monroe character. Mm -hmm. And so when Norma Jean is in some situations, she'll discover something in, in the room that the other did, clothing all, all on the floor, or something is not so clean. Uh, the, the, there was a strange split between Norma Jean as a person mm -hmm. and Marilyn Monroe as some weird almost grotesque magic presence that ultimately killed her. It's like she was sort of haunted by that. Mm -hmm. And I remember writing those scenes where Norma Jean, who's like more of a normal, normal person, mm -hmm. would come home and she'd see some things that, though she'd wake up in the morning and some clothing is all fallen on the floor or the toilet wouldn't be flushed or some weird, or lots of dishes in the sink. That was the other, that wasn't her. And I remember reading that one of the housekeepers at the very end of Marilyn Monroe's life, like the last weeks of her life, the housekeeper would say how Norma Jean or Marilyn Monroe would talk to her in a very flat voice, you know, matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't wearing makeup and she was just a person and she wasn't happy. She was very unhappy. But then the phone would ring and she'd go to the phone and there would be this little voice hello it was like the other self she was presenting it's some complete phantom you know how long can you do that mm. you know like finally you just don't want to do that anymore so i think when i was um, more recently a widow it's like this other self sort of as old it's like a miasma mm. and that's why people with who are accident prone are afraid of heights because I have a friend who is very successful and rational. He can't get too near the edge of a, a precipice. He says, I feel, I feel a hand on my back pushing me and telling me to jump. Hmm. You know, it's so weird because he's not like that. He's not suicidal. Hmm. It's just something where there's some other self in you that's sort of chuckling and saying, oh, why don't you step off? step off that ledge, you know, and you'll say, well, I don't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. So in writing The Surviving Child, 
I put my protagonist in that situation where there's something else going on in, in, in the house. So she just takes a large swallow of spinach and suddenly she's, she's fighting for her life. She's actually choking. Mm. People can take too much, they swallow too much and they, they just choke to death or they swallow a chicken bone or something. Those bizarre accidents happen much more frequently than, than large, you know, melodramatic events. Mm. People slip in the, in the shower and crack their heads, you know. Mm. Household accidents, falling down the stairs. You're, you're hurrying down the stairs and you, you miss a step. And then that never happened in your life before. Mm. But if you're in one of these states and you're, you're distracted by grief, you'd be surprised how you can miss a step your, your mind is, is so distracted. Mm. Driving a car, that's, that's dangerous. Mm. So when I, wrote, when I wrote these novellas about being haunted, I was writing about that. And I have a whole novel. My next novel is called Breathe. It's about a woman who's haunted by her husband, her husband's death. And she's haunted by him as he, as he exists somehow in her memory. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's that's a whole novel. I worked on that after Char after Charlie died. I was trying to really express in, in great detail what it's like to be haunted, not to make it a ghost story or something that's melodramatic, but sort of a psychological, like a journal almost. Where I guess, yeah, you're sort of so much in your head that it's almost like, yeah, you're not physically present or able to to function in, in a way that you normally would. Yeah. Well, there are certain neurological phenomena that interests me too as charlie was a neuroscientist so i have a lot of these books and i've you know he talked a lot about these things mm -hmm. there are neurological things that start to happen to you too you um you may see something that's not there your brain is sending some sort of signal that's actually not there and you can think that somebody resembles somebody else there may be a name for that when people travel around the world they sometimes think they see a familiar face, you know, in Hong Kong or, or Tibet, you know, you think you see somebody that you've known before mm. and you have, that's not, that's not right. It's, it's, it's actually a sense of deja vu. Deja vu is, a, is a, a neurological phenomenon. It's not very understood where we think we've had an experience before. And I like, I like to write about those um, experiences that are actually neurological as well as psychological. There's a reality, the, the brain is doing something that's, that's very real. Charlie used to say that everything that we do or say affects the brain immediately. That the brain is always in some trans, transitional form. Everything you do, if you go for a long walk and you're running in the sunshine and the fresh air, it is immeasurably healthy for your brain by doing it. If you sit in a dark room reading all day long and you know moping or depressed, and you think about exercising, it makes it, there's no difference. Right. Not, nothing's going to happen. Mm. You you have to actually do something to affect your brain. Yeah, I remember um, getting that very sense very strongly um, at a point early on in my life when I was at college and um and uh it was summertime and um and i was lucky in that i didn't have to work that summer and so i decided that um or at least for a month or so i didn't have to do any work and so i thought oh this is wonderful i can just sit at home and i can read all day long and because obviously i've always been a keen reader and so mm -hmm. i thought i'll just you know sequester myself i'll just read all day long so i was just sat in my room you know from dawn until dusk like reading uh, big tomes like Dostoevsky and stuff. And, and after wow. several days, I, I suddenly found myself thinking, I am so depressed. And, and I sort of wondered, like, why, why is this? And like, well, oh, maybe it's because I've been sat in a dark room like for seven days and not, you know, sort of going out and getting fresh air. And yeah, it, you can sort of forget. <laughs> yeah. And then you're reading works that are very thoughtful and, and maybe have a certain tragic dimension to them. So that as well, yeah. That, <laughs> That's important too. But I um I wanted to talk a bit more about um some of the characters in these novellas because uh, in in the title novella uh, Cardiff by the Sea, 
you've written two characters, which I think are my new favorite characters in any fiction who are Elspeth and Morag. Um, and these are two sisters, great aunts of the main character, Claire, who bicker and fuss over her so much that they entirely overwhelm and smother her. Uh, but they are also utterly hilarious to, to read about. And they feel like this elderly female version of Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Um, and their, their back and forth dialogue just sort of whips across the page. And, and it's so vibrant and really comes alive. Um, so I was wondering, what, what was your inspiration for these particular characters? Well, I don't know what, what inspired me, but I loved, I loved writing about, I loved creating them and giving their dialogue. Mm. Probably I cut back a little bit. There's probably a little more than that. Well, they are just completely excruci excruciatingly awful and funny. They're mm. sort of like characters that you might find in Ivy Compton Burnett novel. Mm -hmm. You know her mm -hmm. where the, everything's dialogue and people are whip sharp and they're, they're uh, confronting one another, sort of verbal, like a duel. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted them to be totally manipulating her. They're pretending to be these sort of helpless little old ladies, but they really are, they're, they're much smarter than they're pretending to be. I think she overhears them at one point. She hears them saying something like, she doesn't know who, she doesn't know who we are. You know, she sort of hears them downstairs. Yeah. And then they seem to be poisoning her. And she's so unable to believe that they're really poisoning her that they, they do it more than once. <laughs> you know, there are some screwball comedies of the kind that, I, that I've been seeing, you know, set in the 1930s, uh -huh. where characters are so outrageous and they, they do something and people can't believe how awful they are. Then they do it again and again because that's, that's what comedy is, you know. Mm -hmm. Repetition. So one of the reasons that she might be, um, she might, they might want to kill her is that she will then not be an heiress as it is she's an heir, she's an heiress of some property mm -hmm. and so there's a possibility that they're actually trying to poison her mm. <laughs> yeah and so that's one of the points of tension yeah going through the the novella but um but uh, but yeah, it's an, I found it such an interesting situation to read about because I felt so sympathetic to Claire on the one hand in that she was having to listen to this this ongoing dialogue of, of the the aunts, um, and it, it sort of felt like symbols crashing with like her caught yeah. between the symbols, yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, just this constant noise around her. But but at the same time, I, I found them so entertaining and, and funny in their in their deception and their manipulation, as you say, and like and their um their secretive secrets that they were trying to keep from her, yeah. Yeah, and they're always sort of pretending that she's helpless, actually, a little sleepyhead, and she call, they call her these diminutive names. Mm. So yeah, so she hears these voices. She doesn't remember, she must remember. No, I think she doesn't. She's pretending not to remember. No, I think she actually does not remember. She doesn't remember us who found her. So that looks ahead to the novel later on when you discover that in the flashback that these two women um, had entered into Clara's life when she was just a, a small child mm -hmm. in a very crucial way. It's always hard to talk about mysteries and suspense fiction because so much depends upon revelations later on. Yeah, and you don't um, want to give it away. <laughs> you, you don't really want to give away a plot. <laughs> But there's, um, there's also another wonderful character in uh, one of the novellas uh, who is a cat uh, that, that starts as an innocent, beautiful kitten and grows to become a being who is quite wild and dangerous. And it seems also in some way an extension of the main character who is a, a teenage girl. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that special bond that they form and, uh, and also was uh, or, or was uh, this this cat uh, inspired by your own cats that you have? Well, the story is really about a kind of child abuse and how a child who is essentially sort of passive, whose father has left the family, and so everything is kind of um, dysfunctional, and she feels so undermined and so bereft. When a marriage breaks up, uh, children often feel that they're to blame. They may feel that unconsciously that they're not loved anymore. And so she's sort of a prime to be a victim. 
it's a, it's a little like the situation of, of Violet in my life as a rat. A girl who has been left or mistreated by her father is very vulnerable to being mistreated again because she will feel some strange complicity. Like she, she won't fight back the way a normal girl might. She might just feel that she deserves punishment. The story treads, it sort of goes into the surreal because it's also a, fer a colony of feral cats not too far away. And one of them is a kitten. She, she saves this kitten. The kitten gets larger. When I saw the illustration for the cat, Meow Dao, I was astounded because whoever illustrated the story <laughs> has created this huge white cat. I mean, I, I mean, huge. It looked like the size of a small sheep or something. <laughs> It's kind of like the, um, the festering rage of the girl makes the, the kitten into a predator cat, very large and very beautiful cat. Mm -hmm. A little like Zanchi, but Zanchi, mm -hmm. I think, is gone. Uh, Zanchi's <laughs> gone away. <laughs> but yeah, about the size of Zanchi. Yeah. And that was, fun, that was fun to create. Mm -hmm. it's, my, my meow dow. And then at the end, we don't know whether the cat really has done these things or whether the girl herself, so the girl may herself have taken a knife and, and done something. It's, it's not clear. Mm -hmm. And it has a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, as you, you saying the, the novella is sort of about um, abuse and, and um, there's, there's a line in that novella that I found very powerful where you wrote, the, bu the bully is always the one who has been hurt. And it feels like this statement says so much about the psychology of abuse and the way an abuser justifies what, what they're doing, that, that they're the one who has been hurt. And, uh, and I was wondering if you could speak yeah. more about that a bit. Well, I think initially that's probably the case. I haven't read this biography of, of Donald Trump by his, his sister. Um, uh, his... Uh, um, or niece, niece, I think. niece, Mary Trump. Yeah. yeah. No, I haven't read that, but I read about it. It seems that Donald Trump, as a boy, had been really in, in this very pathological household with a, a domineering and psychologically wounded father, a terrible person, evidently. I mean, it's all, to me, it's like third hand. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, even Donald Trump, who seems like such a malevolent person himself, Probably if you go back to the childhood, that there was some maiming, the maiming of a personality began when he was very young. So they say, that it's said that most bullies have been bullied. Yeah. And the danger of a child being bullied is that he or she will grow up and do the same thing uh, to their own children. That seems to be, it's like al alcoholism. Yeah. So, in, yeah, so in, my, in my novel, I have to find some foil for the bully. The victim herself is probably not gonna be equal to it. There has to be some other source of, of power. Like in, in my short novel, my novella, Rape a Love Story, there's not gonna be justice and there's not even any measure of happiness for this poor woman who has been raped by a number of, of young men. Um, there's no way the, the Criminal justice system is not going to make things right. And they're, they're going to be acquitted. I mean, everything is awful. And there's really not much she can do herself. So a man, um, a sort of a dissociated person, he's, he's disinterested, I mean, uh, he comes in and he affects a kind of justice, a vigil, vigilante justice. Because the bullies are never going to be stopped by the law the law is actually on the side of the bullies in, in this case. So if you're writing a novel, a work of fiction, you have to create, create some plausible dynamic where there might be a restoration of justice, which we look, we look to in literature, especially in genre fiction. Mm -hmm. But it has to be somehow plausible. You know, it can't, it, she can't turn into superwoman. Yeah. You know, if you're writing, literary fiction that's for adults, there can't be these the deus ex machina where something that some 
superhero comes in and saves you. It has to be something plausible. And um, I, I just want to talk about about the setting and landscape in your novellas as well, because obviously with um, Cardiff by the Sea, um, Claire travels to Maine to to settle the inheritance of her house. And uh, I like that. I like that. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful cover for that, and it, that gets that sense of of place and. Um, and and I think it's interesting that you've um, you've written in some short stories before uh, about Maine um, as well, and because obviously it personally endears me to that since I'm I'm from the state of Maine, and um, and in uh, the one one of uh, my favorite stories of yours, um, Fractal, um, takes place in, in oh, yeah, Maine. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my stories of my own. I don't <laughs> know why I'm so haunted by that story, of Fractal. Mm. It's so unusual for me to be that. I, I don't know why. I'm so haunted by that story. It's very weird. And sometimes I lie in bed and I think of that story. Hmm. Believe me, I'm not like that. I usually just move on and I think of what I'm working on. Hmm. The main setting I wanted because of the uh, Winslow, Winslow Homer, you know, that yes. the woman protagonist had this other life, this other, she was interested in art. Hmm. So this other life, had been lost to her when she had a child. She chose not to have an abortion. So that's a good example of, of the alternative lives. Mm -hmm. Because in that, in that story, we see her alternative life and she forgets she had a baby, she forgets she had a child. Mm -hmm. He's annihilated. The reader remembers, but she's forgotten and nobody else remembers. Because in the fractal, in a fractal museum your deepest wish comes true, including the wishes you don't know you had, mm. which I find so scary. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Deepest, if you go to the zone, your deepest wishes come true if you go there, but you don't always know what they are. Yeah, it's unconscious. And that's really so scary. Um, I, I just want to go a bit back to um, the, the issue in uh, the surviving child as well, where like in the, the in Cardiff by the Sea, um, you, you explore the issue of filicide and you, um, you, you talk a bit about the, the inspiration for why you wrote about that in the surviving child. But it, um, it just like occurred to me as I was reading them, how this is also occurs at the beginning of the gravedigger's daughter in the opening terrifying scene where uh, a father chooses to murder most of his family. Um, so I, I was wondering why this is a subject you you come back to, have come back to in a few different fictions in, in very different ways. Well, I remember my novel Wonderland begins with something like that. They're yeah. called family, yeah. family Annihilators. Mm -hmm. I think I'm drawn to that theme because it's like a, li a literal embodiment of something that might happen psychologically. You know, that there are family annihilators are very rare statistically, and yet in a more emotional, psychological sense, there may be a lot of family annihilators, people who annihilate their families. Like the father of the girl who would grow up to be Marilyn Monroe, he kind of annihilated her, she would never be happy. She would always feel that she was incomplete, that why did her father disown her, leave her? Like Marilyn Monroe, all through her life, if she lived to be 95, she would never ever forget that there was a man who was her father, who didn't acknowledge her even after she was famous. She telephoned him, she called him, she found out who it was. And she called his house and his, his wife answered. And the wife said, he doesn't want to talk to you. Mm. You know, and she was famous at that point. Mm. You know, the, the annihilation of the spirit by an adult of, of a child, I guess that just interests me as a, as a great tragedy. And it probably happens a lot. Oh, there are ways that people deal with child abuse, you know, social welfare, social workers, but this other kind of abuse is psychological and, you know, emotional damage. And I guess I'm just drawn to those subjects. Yeah. And I guess it's sort of the, the ultimate example of sort of rejection by a, a family, even though obviously it's not personally about that, that child. Yes. And, it, and without even wanting, wanting to know her at all. I think when Norma Jean was in, she was in 
an astounding number of foster homes. I only put one in the novel and I put one in the orphanage. I think she was in something like 14 foster homes. In her, I mean, mm. you know, you can't do that in a novel. You might suggest it in a biography, but you can't have 14 foster homes because it's, you know, you, you have to select, select. Yeah. Well, I, I grew up in an area of upstate New York that where there was a good deal of, uh, of poverty, a rural, rural poverty. And there were a lot of broken families and families broken by alcoholism. So some of my girl friends were, were like that. They were children of abusive parents, especially fathers. Oh, the father would disappear for weeks, you know. I, I could sort of see their faces and I went to school with them. So I just sort of felt uh, like a sister, a sisterly sense mm. of um, wanting, wanting to tell their stories. Mm. But they, many of them never finished school. I mean, they may have dropped out at eighth grade. So there was no way they would ever tell their own stories. And they probably got married when they were very young. They had babies very young. And, who knows what happened to them. And um, I also wanted to talk about uh, the uh, novella in the collection, which we haven't discussed yet, um, Phantom Wise 1972, which um, the, the year stated in that, that title comes to feel so significant when you realize it's a, a story about a young woman with an unwanted pregnancy. And that in that year, obviously, it's set immediately before the Supreme Court's decision on Roe versus Wade. And you, you've written before about the subject of abortion um, in, in your fiction, um, most notably in A Book of American Martyrs, which is brilliant, not least of all, because it's a, it's a book about abortion, which doesn't actually include an abortion in, in the, the story, um, which was so clever. So this... You're the only person who noticed that. Uh... <laughs> I think the abortion novel issue of the abortion is on like almost every page is an issue, but yet there's not a real abortion. Yeah, I thought I would... I thought I would do that. Now, I have written about abortion in other stories, in other fictions, but not in that now. And obviously, this has always been a contentious issue in American politics, and even more so in recent um, months, and probably will be in, in, in these future months as well. But, um, but I was wondering, what, what inspired you to, to write that novella, Phantom Wise, 1972? Well, you know what Phantom Wise comes from, don't you? The, I, I don't uh, actually, no. Oh, what, what's gosh, that? I don't have it here in front of me. It's um, Alice. It's a poem that Lewis Carroll wrote about oh, Alice. Alice, mm -hmm. and it's so filled with yearning and memory and nostalgia. He's thinking back to when Alice Liddell was a little girl, and he would take her in the canoe, or I guess it was a rowboat, row, rowing rowboat, and he would think of her. Now she's grown up phantom wise still you still you're with me phantom wise it's a very beautiful poem and it's a little like a nabokovian situation mm -hmm. where a man an adult man is fantasizing in a very um really sort of beautiful way N not not erotic it's really not erotic at all but sort of spiritual. The little girls seem to embody a spiritual innocence to a person, to a bachelor like Lewis Carroll. Mm. Um, I haven't read that much about Lewis Carroll. I don't know that he was a gay, perhaps he was gay and he never realized it. I don't really know, but he, he was very susceptible to the innocence of girls. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he was, a, I don't think he was a predator or a child molester. I think there's a whole category of men who never really grow up and they're afraid of adult women. Mm -hmm. uh, he would have been terrified probably by an adult, you know, an adult female, someone his own age. But Alice and the other little girls, he would take them out rowing and they have picnics together. They were not any, any threat. And I think he felt that little boys were too rambunctious and noisy. And the little girls were like a distillation of the female, but very, very innocent and not dangerous at all. Mm -hmm. So st still I remember you phantom wise, Alice beneath, beneath skies. And it's a beautiful poem. 
So Phantom Lies, the, the novella is about a girl named Alice, A-L-Y-C-E. And she has a relationship with an older poet. Oh, I found it. Should I read it? Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, please do. Yeah, I'd like to hear it. It's on page 287 of Phantom Lies. So it's this older poet who is reciting the poem to Al his Alice. Mm -hmm. A boat beneath a sunny sky, lingering onward dreamily in an evening of July. Children three, three that nestle near, eager eye and willing ear, pleased a simple tale to hear. Long has paled that summer's sunny sky. Echoes fade and memories die. Autumn frosts have slain July. Still she haunts me phantom wise. Alice moving under skies never seen by waking eyes. That's beautiful. That could be Humbert Humbert. Hmm. Still she haunts me phantom wise, Alice moving under skies never seen by waking eyes. That's Lewis Carroll. That's, hmm. that's the expression of a man in the throes of a compulsion, a com an overwhelming fantasy in his life that gave his life meaning. Hmm. Now, somebody might say harshly, well, he's a sexual predator or he would like to be, or he's some sort of misfit. I don't really see it that way. I see that we're all, we're all enthralled by the unconscious. If we're lucky, we, we are drawn to things that society conventionally thinks are, you know, admissible, you know, mm -hmm. you're quote, normal, but that's just a luck. There are many people like, like Lewis Carroll who are not what you call normal and a, like a perennial bachelor. Mm. And, and many of these people create great works of yearning and beauty. Like I think this poem is beautiful. Mm. Like Autumn frosts have slain July. Mm. Well, that's like Keats that could be Shelley. Mm. But the word phantom wise meant a lot to me. So that's a title. And uh, I, I also really connected with a, a line that's within uh, the surviving child where you write, uh, in poetry, you chisel the most beautiful words out of language. In life, you stutter words. It is never possible to speak so beautifully as you wish to speak. And I know uh, as, as someone who often finds it difficult to articulate my thoughts in person and like prefers to just you know write letters and, and have that sort of correspondence, I, I really related to this. Um, so when, when I, we last spoke, um, you, you commented how you're naturally more a quiet person, but I was wondering if you've found it easier to articulate your thoughts in person as as time goes on. Because I know, like early on in your career, you um, didn't give so many interviews, but it seems in in recent years you you've given a lot more interviews. So, do you feel more comfortable? Do you think with speaking that way? Well, it depends on who the interviewer is. Obviously, I consider what we're doing and having a conversation. So mm. you're very interesting to me and, and the conversation is, is, is wonderful. But there are sometimes interviewers by uh, interviewers who are really not very prepared or they're, they're, they have a kind of, you know, banal imagination or whatever. So mm. that's not so much fun. Mm. But because I'm a professor, I probably am more articulate, you know, than, than I used to be when I before, before I was a professor. When I was a student, I would tend to be a little shy and quiet. But I've always liked, I've always liked to write. And when when we're writers and poets, especially, we have such control of the language. Mm. I saw a wonderful interview with Steve Martin the other day, mm. and I, I know Steve Martin actually, and he is. He is sometimes quite funny socially, like at a dinner. At a dinner, he can be funny, but he's not. It's not the same as a stand-up comedian. And mm -hmm. Steve was saying in this interview that people will sort of expect him to be funny, you know. And he said, you know, I had, I had four hours of comic material when I was a stand-up comic. He worked on that. He had four hours, and no, that's all he had, <laughs> and mm -hmm. he parried back, you know, but. He, he wrote that, he worked on that it's for crime. years, yeah. you know. Mm. And, he, you, and people expect that I could just do this, you know, like at a party. Mm. I could walk down the street and I'll be in a restaurant and just come out with this, you know, this distilled comedy, you know. People have such bizarre ideas of others. Mm. 
Well, I think, yeah, especially when you uh, become such a, you know, famous personality like um, like that, where people, uh, there's this assumed intimacy and, and that, and knowledge of someone and, and you assume what you see on the screen is, is who that person is, but obviously that's, a, it's, you know, sort of a persona that's, that's been put on and, and, it, or it's, it's somebody, you know, practicing their craft, whether it's comedy or yeah, acting or. Yes. And also taking a lot of time with it. Yeah. I mean, poetry, yeah. poetry can consume hours and hours and hours of people's time. And then mm -hmm. when it's, when it's read, it can, it can sound very fluent and, you know, even artless. Emily Dickinson has these dashes, you know, as if it's sort of breathless, mm. but she worked hard. And sometimes we see she would have a manuscript she'd be working on literally for years. Mm. Some lines would recur. She'd get a line, like five years later, she'd use the line in a poem or she'd have a line in a letter. Mm. You know, these were very, very, very premeditated, mm. but the poems seem breathless. And I, I also want to um, briefly mention uh, this new anthology um, called Cutting yeah. Edge, which you, um, you edited. And, uh, and this, uh, I know this came out uh, last year in the United States, but it's only just been published here in the UK at the beginning of uh, November. And uh, it has the subtitle, Noir Stories by Women. And uh, so I, I just wanted to ask briefly, um, how this book came about and what, what inspired you to, to work on it? Well, I've always wanted to do something like that. And I um, had I had edited two other books for Akashic Books. Johnny Temple is sort of well-known in, in Brooklyn as a small press. It's not that small, a small press, but it's not a huge commercial press, Akashic Books. Mm -hmm. I did New Jersey Noir. He has a whole series like New Jersey Noir, New York Noir, Egypt Noir. Um, Calcutta Noir, all around the world, the, they're very popular. They started out with just uh, like New York City Noir, Manhattan Noir, I was in that. Then he asked me, I guess he must have asked me to edit New Jersey Noir. So I wrote to a number of people. Then he, then Johnny Temple asked me to edit Prison Noir because I had taught in San Quentin. Charlie and I had taught in San Quentin. I think it was 2011 or 2012, we were teaching in San Quentin. So I did that. Then I suggested to Johnny that I do something called female noir, you know, writings by of crime and mystery by, by women. Mm -hmm. He said, well, we need a different title because the noir series is all places mm -hmm. like prison or Detroit or Minneapolis or whatever, <laughs> Milwaukee mm -hmm. noir. And I said, why can't we just have female noir? He said, no, no, we need a different title. So a couple of years went by and finally, I guess I came up with the idea of cutting edge stories by women. And I'm not sure that noir is in, maybe noir is not in, is noir in the title? I'm not sure. Um, it is in the yeah subtitle in the UK edition where it says noir stories yeah. by women. Um, but I, I think in the U.S. It, it's subtitled like crime and mystery. Yeah, I don't think the word noir is used. For some reason, he wanted to keep the series, the noir word in the series. But anyway, so finally, we, we agreed. <laughs> and then I went ahead and, and wrote to people like Margaret Atwood and Valerie Martin and, and many others, Amy Bender. It was a lot of fun. And your, your, uh, you have a story in this as well uh, called Assassin um, about a much aggrieved woman who feels compelled to take her vengeance upon a loathsome male political leader um, by sawing off his head. And, uh, and obviously her character is very different um, from you, uh, but I was wondering if this story was partly a way for you to, to channel your own anger uh, about the current political landscape and certain self-concerned male leaders? <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, I, I don't remember when I wrote that, but I, I, I got the idea, it might have been like, it might have been 2018, or it might have been, I don't remember, but the idea came to me when I was at, at the Dub, Dublin Ghost Story Festival. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't last year or the year before, but it may have been the year before that. Yeah, so the story is actually not set, it's not set in America. Mm -hmm. And I remember 
thinking after Boris Johnson was, was elected, people will think it's about Boris Johnson or maybe Trump. But when I wrote it, when I wrote the story, Boris Johnson wasn't, wasn't elected yet. Yeah. And um, huh. I kind of invented this idea of the, the male uh, aggressor and this, the woman who feels that nobody looks at her anymore because she's, she's older and she's very heavy and she's kind of a monstrous woman. But I wanted her to be very funny. She's complaining. She's just, she's complaining about everything, you know. Ranting, yeah. <laughs> she's just like everything she's complaining about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read that story a few times and people really laugh. They really <laughs> laugh at it. And then at the end, she kind of is flirting with the head and she sort of likes the head. It's like she's sort of being, you know, charmed by this horrible person after mm -hmm. all. So they're kind of a couple <laughs> at the end. A good example of a surreal story. <laughs> yeah, it's very surreal and, and disturbing. But yeah, like it, it, it does also, help the, because it's so uh, outrageous that I guess, yeah, it has that, that sort of comic sense or, or you can only laugh because it's, yeah, what, what she does is so um, outrageous. <laughs> um. But you know, Eric, when you think about it, the person who would be most liable to have the opportunity to assassinate um, a man, a horrible man with power, would be somebody like a cleaning woman. Mm. You know, it because nobody else is going to have access. Mm -hmm. And when he's out in public, you couldn't get close to him, you know, with a gun or any with a knife or anything because of the Secret Service and the, the security. But he would be all alone, like say in his bedroom or his bathroom, and mm -hmm. he might have a servant, he might have an attendant, you know, there'll be some woman who's doing the cleaning his bathroom, mm -hmm. she would be the one who could assassinate him. She mm -hmm. would be like the only one, you know? Yeah, because so, everyone just sees her as invisible, yeah. Yeah, and also she's an, in, she's an intimate quarters with him. Mm -hmm. So all, the, all these very famous people whom we know, you know, from, let's say, we see their pictures in, in journalism and on television, they all go home, they have homes, they mm -hmm. go into their bedrooms, Somebody may be waiting there to pick up their clothing that they throw on the floor. Uh, the more money they have, the more servants they have. And it's the, like the valet to the prime minister who could really, <laughs> who could really kill, kill the person. So mm -hmm. even though it's a surreal story, it does have a certain logic to it. Well, uh, I um, want to thank you so much for um, speaking with me again. It's, it's, um, it's always such a pleasure talking to you and, and, uh, and it's, it's very inspiring and enlightening um, as, as well. So, so thank you very much for chatting with me and, and, uh, and you know, fingers yeah. crossed for these coming weeks. I know all of us uh, Americans oh, are very yeah. tense about what's gonna happen. And I've, uh, you know, I've sent in my, my absentee ballot and that's sort of all I can do and just sort of Good wish for, for the best. Well, before we leave, I'll bring Lilith over just to say hello, my kitty. Yeah, please do. And she's gone. If she cooperates. <laughs> she's with me all day long. She's oh. off behind me when I'm on Zoom. <laughs> she sometimes sleeps right behind me or at my feet. Oh. <laughs> she's trying to figure out where you are. Yeah. She can't make eye contact. Can okay. hear me, but yeah. <laughs> okay. She, she has striking me. eyes. It's, it's yes. so weird. Bye bye. I always bye -bye. promise a cat. I always deliver. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, bye -bye. guys.